I'm Dr. Chris Masterjohn of chrismasterjohnphd.com, and this is the recording of the February 17th Ask Me Anything About Nutrition, where members of the CMJ Masterpass asked me questions, and I answered. This is Mastering Nutrition with Chris Masterjohn. Take control of your health, master the science, and apply it like a pro. Are, 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 are you ready? This is a recording of the February 17th CMJ Master Pass Ask Me Anything that took place over Zoom. Members of the CMJ Master Pass have access to, at least once a month, a meeting where they ask me anything and I answer, and all of you guys get the recording. So in this episode, we talked about things such as iron. Should you be donating blood if your transferrin saturation is high, but your ferritin is low? Is vitamin A toxic? How to manage twitching in response to caffeine? Do children need more nutrients because they're growing or less nutrients because they weigh less? Is vitamin A dangerous in pregnancy? Are creatine non-responders a real thing? And what, if anything, you can do about it with a special unexpected cameo from Alex Leaf? Quite a number of questions on how to interpret organic acids on a urinary organic acids panel. How to manage sleep problems while fasting. What to do for markers of B6 deficiency that just won't budge even at 45 milligrams a day of P5P. What to do about quinolinate produced in your body from too much estrogen keeping you up at night, even if you're a man. If you'd like to ask a question in the next Ask Me Anything, sign up for the CMJ Master Pass at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass slash mastering nutrition. Using that URL or clicking the link in the description of this episode will get you a 10% off lifetime discount. This is just a small sample of questions that we get into. So without further ado, let's hear a word from my sponsors and then get into the Q&A. This episode is brought to you by Ample. Ample is incredible. It's a meal in a bottle that takes a total of two minutes to prepare, consume, and clean up. Two minutes. I'm not kidding. Now, I know what you're thinking. Anything that quick just has to be made of synthetic ingredients that you'd have a hard time pronouncing and wouldn't want to put into your body. But it's not. Ample is made entirely from natural ingredients and designed to provide an optimal balance between protein, fat, and carbs, as well as all the vitamins and minerals that you'd need in a single meal. There's no question that it's always best to sit down and take your time eating a home-cooked meal from fresh ingredients. But let's face it, oftentimes we just don't have time for that. If you live a busy life like I do and your goal is to get things done, you need quality fuel that you can get into your system quickly. Here's a great example where Ample is perfect for me. When I shoot videos, it takes hours to set up and break down all of my equipment. So I try to get as many videos shot in a day as possible. This prevents wasting a lot of time on setup and helps me conserve big blocks of time outside of shooting videos to get into a flow state where I can research something to my heart's content and spend all the time I need thinking about it creatively and analytically. But if I spend hours dealing with recording equipment plus hours spent preparing food, eating it, and cleaning up, there's like no time left over to actually shoot any videos. So on recording days, I use Ample to maximize efficiency and focus on getting things done. Ample comes in three versions, original, keto, and vegan. And each version comes in two portion sizes, 400 calorie and 600 calorie. The 600 calorie original version gives me 37 grams of protein from a mix of grass-fed whey and collagen, which promotes satiety and flips my brain on. Its fat comes from coconut oil and macadamia nut oil. I like these oils because they're low in polyunsaturated fatty acids, or PUFAs, oils that promote aging and are usually loaded into the processed foods that most people eat when they need something on the go. The coconut oil provides some medium-chain fats to keep my energy levels up, too. 
The carbs, the vitamins, and the minerals all come exclusively from food sources like sweet potatoes, bananas, cocoa powder, wheat, and barley grass, and chlorella. It's full of natural prebiotic fibers and probiotics to promote a healthy microbiome, and the gentle sweetness comes from a mix of honey, monk fruit, and stevia. I just mix it with water, drink it, rinse out the bottle, and boom, two minutes in and I'm fully fueled and ready to face the next phase of the day. I first came across Ample when I met its founder and CEO, Connor Young, at PaleoFX a few years ago. Connor inspired me with his vision for Ample, which I anticipate will be much more than a meal in a bottle in the near future. I've become an official advisor to Ample, and I'll be helping Ample design scientific research that will lead both to an ever-improving Ample and, I hope, meaningful contributions to our understanding of how to use nutrition to help people be healthier and happier and perform better at the challenges that they care most about. As a listener to the Mastering Nutrition podcast, I've also worked out a special deal for you. If you use the discount code CHRIS15, you'll get 15% off your first order of Ample. To get your discount, go to amplemeal.com. That's amplemeal.com, A-M-P-L-E-M-E-A-L.com, amplemeal.com, and use the code CHRIS15 at checkout. This episode is brought to you by Ancestral Supplements. Traditional peoples, Native Americans, and early ancestral healers believe that eating the organs from a healthy animal would strengthen and support the health of the corresponding organ of the individual. For example, the traditional way of treating a person with a weak heart was to feed the person the heart of a healthy animal. Modern science makes sense of this. Heart is uniquely rich in coenzyme Q10, which supports heart health. The importance of eating organs, though, is much broader than simply matching the organ you eat to the organ you want to nourish. For example, natives of the Arctic had very limited access to plant foods and got their vitamin C from adrenal glands. And vitamin C is important to far more parts of your body than simply your adrenals. In his epic work, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, Weston Price recorded a story of natives who cured blindness using eyeballs, which are very rich in vitamin A. But now that we understand vitamin A, we know that we can get even more vitamin A by eating liver, making liver good for your eyes. Our ancestors made liberal use of organ meats both to be economical and to utilize their healing and nourishing properties. Animals in the wild do the same. Weston Price had also recorded a story of how the zoos in his era were capturing lions, tigers, and leopards, oh my, only to watch them become infertile in captivity. Researchers then observed what the lions did when they killed zebras in the wild. What they did was they went straight for the organs and bone marrow, leaving the muscle meat behind for the birds. But even the birds took what they could of the organs and bone marrow. Price reported that once the zookeepers started feeding the animals organ meats, boom, their fertility returned. The problem I often encounter, though, is that many people just don't like eating organ meats. Let's face it, if you weren't raised on them, it can be very hard to acquire a taste for them. That is where Ancestral comes in. Ancestral Supplements has a nose-to-tail product line of grass-fed liver, organ meats, living collagen, bone marrow, and more, all in the convenience of a gelatin capsule. For more information or to buy any of their products, go to ancestralsupplements.com. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. All right. Thomas Pereira, um, oh, if anyone thinks my volume is bad, please let me know in the chat if you feel it's too quiet, but I th- this is where it was last time, so it should be good. Thomas Pereira asks, neither my mother nor myself respond to normal or even high doses of Cytomel T3, up to 140 micrograms per day in divided doses with thermogenesis. Body temperatures remain low, reverse T3 is normal. Could you discuss the factors that may be interfering with heat production in response to T3 and offer considerations of how to improve this? Man, that's an awesome question, but I don't know if I have an answer to that. Um, so clearly, uh, clearly the, what, the, what, what having good levels of reverse T3 tells you is that it doesn't seem like the body is deliberately getting rid of the thyroid hormone. Um, so reverse you know, reverse T3, I would consider that a sign that I would consider that a sign that your body just like doesn't want the thyroid hormone around and and you're trying to manipulate the thyroid hormone and your body is just saying like, no, I, I'm too stressed to carry this out. 
that doesn't seem to be happening. And so that makes me wonder if, um, if there could be a problem with taking up the thyroid into the cells, in which case um, I would expect thyroid hormone levels to be higher in the blood than you would otherwise expect them to be. Or if there's a problem with the thyroid actually carrying out its functions at, inside the cell to regulate gene expression. And a couple of things that would pop up there would be that zinc is necessary to allow the thyroid receptor to bind to the DNA. In fact, zinc is necessary for all everything that has a nuclear receptor that alters gene expression by something binding to a nuclear receptor, they're all zinc dependent. So the receptors for vitamin A and vitamin D, the receptors for, uh, for the sex hormone, for thyroid hormone, all require zinc to act. So if you're zinc deficient, that could be possible. But I would expect, I mean, you seem to be saying that it's a specific thermogenesis response. And so I, you know, that makes me ask, um, is, is it only thermo? Like, are you seeing every other thing that you would expect from thyroid hormone and not thermogenesis? If that's the case, I have no idea. Um, but if you're not seeing any of the effects from thyroid hormone that you would expect, then, then I would say maybe some kind of resistance not getting to the cell if the blood levels are higher than you would expect them to be, or if the blood levels are normal, maybe not acting on the nuclear sector. I would think zinc deficiency, also high levels of free fatty acids. Um, Thomas is raising his hand. Um, let me call on Thomas. This is the first time I've done this. So, uh, Thomas, you're allowed to talk. Do you want to come on screen too, or just talk? Hi, Chris. Can you hear me? Yeah. Wow. Is audio good or do you want video, Tim? Uh, you know, uh, if you want to do the video, I can do that. Um, let's see. Do you call on me again to do the video or do I press something? Uh, no, I think you are. I think you sh if your video is on, you should be able to. Um, I should be able to see you now. I can't. Anyway. Uh, okay. Let's just go forward with the question. So. Oh, sure. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add that the only uh, response that I do get to the thyroid hormone is increase in heart rate. Um, okay. And as far as thermogenesis, uh, absolutely nothing at all. And that's, that's uh, yeah. take, taking super physiological doses as well. What do the blood levels look like? Do they look normal or do they look high? Uh, since I started with uh, experimenting with, with very high doses, I haven't had my blood levels checked, but I would guess that they're very high. I've heard of some other people taking uh, very high doses and their T3 levels in the blood test go to levels that are even undetectable by the normal screening. Yeah, my my suspicion is that um, someone knows the answer to this, and I and I just don't have the knowledge around thyroid hormones to answer it. Uh, it's you know like thyroid is an interesting subject for me, but it hasn't been what I've been digging into the most in the last few years. Um, so I I do think that it's possible that there could be resistance from elevated free fatty acids or for I, I, I do have type one diabetes and I think that high oh. free fatty acids is typical in type one diabetes. Oh, okay. I missed that for context. Um, mm -hmm. so I know I like, I definitely can't answer that question at the level of what is, what is the reason why you do respond with heart rate and don't respond with heat and other things. I don't, I can't answer it at that level, but I can say that I, I would expect type one diabetes and perhaps other aspects of type one diabetes, but certainly the elevation of free fatty acids. I would expect that to cause a level of thyroid hormone resistance on the, on the basis of, uh, of animal experiments and cellular experiments showing that free fatty acids inhibit the binding of thyroid hormone to its nuclear receptor. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what to do with that except suppress the free fatty acids. I mean, if you're on insulin therapy, that what, well, what? So how are you d managing your type one diabetes? Um, I'm eating a uh, let's see, a uh, moderate to high carb, uh, moderate protein and lowish fat diet. Um, I take uh, aspirin, niacinamide to deal with. Uh, uh, free fatty acids. 
And I treat with sufficient insulin to keep myself uh, at fairly good levels. I have uh, yeah. fairly good control. Especially. Well, I don't, I don't know. What, I, I mean, I don't know what else you could do if, with the exception of um, measure the free fatty acids. And if they are elevated, I mean, they might not be if you're, if you're, t- if you're taking insulin and you're eating high, moderate to high carb, you, I don't know how elevated they are. Um, but additionally, antilipolytic mechanisms like uh, exogenous ketones. I mean, that's probably, I don't, I, that's probably a bad idea. Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I would, I would start with like, maybe see if you can get free fatty acids measured, which would often be called NEFA, N-E-F-A for non-esterified fatty acids. I, I did have them measured um, early on uh, in my diagnosis and before I was on actually sufficient insulin. And they were in range, but at the top, topper level of the range, but nothing that seemed extreme. But I don't know if uh, high range, even in the high range, that could be problematic. I don't know either because the, the, the amount of evidence that we have is A, it's from animals and B, it's only a couple studies and C, it's, it really isn't that clear about what the concentration is needed because where it's happening is at the level of the nuclear receptor and you don't necessarily have the blood concentrations exactly reflecting what's actually making it into those compartments of the cell. So it's kind of going off on a limb saying that that reducing free fatty acids might be the thing that helps. Um, it's pretty speculative and obviously you have to be super careful with that because anything you do to suppress lipolysis or get more carbohydrate in or take, you know, all of that could affect your insulin requirement and, and, and so on. Um, but the only other thing I can think of off the top of my head is to look at your plasma zinc. Have you done that? I have not. That's definitely. I take a look at that because, because zinc is needed for the uh, bind needed for all the nuclear receptors to bind to the DNA and thyroid hormone is one of the things Mm -hmm. that that impacts. Mm -hmm. And um, so just to uh, finish up real quick, I just want to ask a philosophical question. Um, What is the most important thing to maintain your body temperature at a good level or to ensure that your temperature is being generated through your metabolism? Because I do notice that if I do keep my temperature up with clothing and heaters, I have uh, better cognitive function but I don't. Yeah. Think well, generated. that's, that's a, um, that's a really interesting question. I think that they are both important. So like one of the reasons that you maintain a certain body temperature is because it makes all your enzymes work at the way, the way they're supposed to, right? So your metabolism gets seriously messed up if your core body temperature is not what it's supposed to be. Sometimes it's supposed to go up. Sometimes it's supposed to go down. So when you have a fever, it goes up because you're deliberately trying to impact processes that work at a higher rate when you have higher temperature. When you go to sleep, you're trying to pull it down because the processes that you're trying to engage in are optimized at that body temperature. Um, And so to some degree, if you can modify that with clothing, it makes tremendous sense. I mean, as sort of proof of like intuitive proof of principle, look at someone who can't fall asleep if they're wearing pajamas and heavy blankets and can sleep fine if they're in boxer shorts and just have a sheet on them, right? Because it didn't matter that, like you could have lowered your core body temperature by taking three to six grams of glycine, but you fell asleep because you took the sheets off and you took the PJs off, right? So, you know, it's both, but it's, it's absolutely the case that if you feel better cognitive function when you have more clothes on to compensate for lower body temperature, that absolutely makes physiological sense that you would want to do that. I mean, I would, you know, you can't have everything. I would, I would rather your, your pancreas just start making all the insulin it needs, but nice. your options are limited, right? So I don't know if you can fix the, the temperature issue. If you can with fixing it at the root problem, great. But if you can't, then absolutely I would, I would manage your temperature with clothing, especially if you're, I mean, you're telling me that you got the payoff. So I think that's a a clear win. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. That was very helpful. Yep. Um, Okay. Oops.
All right. So uh, Tiana Tallent says considerations for elevated morning blood glucose readings mid nineties. Um, I think usually your morning glucose is primarily impacted by your hormones and very rarely impacted by what you ate the night before, unless you are severely glucose intolerant. So the overwhelming probability is that if your blood glucose is elevated in the morning and mid nineties is, you know, not tremendously high, but there's certainly a lot of people who would want it lower than that, but that's, you know, probably cortisol. Um, so if there are other signs of slipping t- into prediabetes, then I might come up with another explanation, but I don't think waking up in the morning and often having mid nineties glucose with everything else being fine is likely to be a sign other than, than cortisol levels. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing because you're supposed to have a cortisol spike in the morning. You might want to look at your cortisol levels over time. The, uh, the Dutch test can look at that. It happens to look at a lot of other things that I think are useful. So that might be my first go-to. There are certainly other tests uh, that just look at cortisol over the time course of the day that you can use. Um, what to do about it? Well, I mean, you, you first want to know if that's actually the, the issue um, if it's out of range, then you probably want to look at stress reduction as a first step. There's some evidence for using phosphatidylserine to lower cortisol. Usually people use that at night for sleep. Um, but I would certainly look at stress management as the first step. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily be, um, I wouldn't necessarily be freaked out about that. All right. Thanks, Tiana. Um, Anonymous says, do you have any thoughts on detoxing heavy metals? Yeah, I did a video about this. And my thought is, look at how bad the heavy metal is. And if it's, if it's at the level where a conventional practitioner would say, you have lead toxicity, for example, then you need a fairly extreme solution of that, that I don't feel comfortable advising anyone on. But if it's like your levels are a little bit high and you want to reduce them, then my suggestion would be zinc supplementation on the basis that most heavy metals produce a metallothionine increase. Metallothionine is your endogenous chelator. And the ability of a heavy metal to provoke that, that protective response is completely dependent on zinc concentrations inside your cell, even across the range of deficiency through normal status through through more zinc than you need. And there's no evidence for a threshold or cutoff. So I think if your zinc status is fine and you boost your zinc status a little a little bit better without hurt without uh, causing any zinc toxicity, then or without causing copper deficiency or deficiencies of other minerals, I think that's a very gentle and safe way to reduce your load of heavy metals. Unless what you're seeing is arsenic, in which case methylation would be my focus because methylation plays a specific role in addressing arsenic. And for anyone who hasn't seen it, I have a comprehensive methylation resource at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash methylation. So those would be my ideas for gentle nutritional approaches. Anita Morgan says... What nutrients are needed to break down old damaged bone and build new bone? So you are breaking down bone all the time throughout uh, every second of your life. You, we are always breaking down bone. We are always building up new bone. And if you had any kind of defect in the ability to break down old bone, then you would have problems manifesting elsewhere because bone breakdown is necessary to maintain your serum calcium levels. You would probably be having severe uh, hypocalcemic attacks if you were not breaking down your bone, your old bone. And you would probably also have exercise intolerance and um, or poor exercise performance as a result of the uh, undercarboxylated osteocalcin release from bone, which acts as a hormone to improve energy utilization during exercise. And if you don't have those problems, you probably have the capacity to break down bone. And in fact, 
unless you're taking a bone resorption inhibitor, in which case the, the way to break down old bone would be to get off the bone resorption inhibitor. Um, in fact, the overwhelming problem in the general population is, is uh, that people are breaking down too much bone and not building it back up enough. So if you just look at the, at, you know, someone's, the course of someone's life over time, when we are young, we are building more bone than we're breaking down. And that somewhere around 25 years old or so, give, it, give or take a few years, and it depends on male and female, we reach peak bone mass and then the, we spend the entire rest of our lives declining in bone mass. Why are we declining? Because we're breaking down bone faster than we're building up. So, um, so almost everyone has the capacity to break down bone and just is really missing out on the building new bone elements. To some degree, when you're building new tissue, you need everything. And so eating a nutrient-dense diet across the board is important. But for things that are extremely important that kind of stand out from building other tissues when you're building bone is collagen. So about half your bone is protein, about 95% of the protein in your bone is collagen. The limiting factor for collagen synthesis is glycine. Collagen peptides provide glycine, and they also are better at stimulating collagen synthesis than just powdered glycine. So collagen peptides, bone broth, edible bones from canned fish or from the ends of chick small chicken bones would all probably be helpful. And then clearly calcium and phosphorus are the overwhelming minerals in bones. So you need enough calcium and you need enough phosphorus between the two of those in the population most people do not get enough calcium and get too much phosphorus people get phosphorus from processed foods and from soda um, in addition to the natural phosphorus in meat and other foods um, if you are not eating junk food you probably don't get too much phosphorus but you still probably get enough if you're not eating junk food and you're not eating dairy and you're not eating bones, you probably do not get enough calcium. And in particular, many people in the natural health community have read a lot of anti-calcium supplementation stuff. I want to emphasize over and over again that it's better to get calcium from food than to get calcium from supplements, but it's better to get calcium from supplements than to not get calcium. And so if you're not eating bones and you're not eating, um, and you're not eating green vegetables to some extent, but mainly bones and dairy products, then you need to supplement with calcium or find some other way to get the, to get a thousand to 1500 milligrams of calcium. In. And then beyond that, there's a lot of trace minerals in bone. Magnesium is certainly important for bone building. There's not a lot of magnesium in bone, but, uh, but magnesium and copper and vitamin C just to, to support the proper production of collagen, manganese. I mean, you start getting to every nutrient directly or indirectly plays some importance in the bone. And so if you've addressed the things that I just said, then you really want to look very personally and individually at what is your weakest link because after those main factors, it could be almost anything. Heather Chandler says, an ethical vegan has low arachidonic acid and wants to increase it. Are there any vegan sources of arachidonic acid? This person also has impaired delta-6 desaturase enzyme activity and has stopped EPA and DHA supplementation. Should that help increase arachidonic acid? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> you, you're someone in this position is very much stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, there are arachidonic acid supplements on Amazon that you can get. I have no idea if they're vegan, if they are vegan, they've got to be synthetic. Short of that, um, maybe this person would get better results from evening primrose oil or barrage oil. I'd try a, maybe a combination and see if that does anything. It might or might not, depending on how bad their enzyme activity is. Short of that, there's, you know, you either have low arachidonic acid or you find some way to tweak your ethics in a way that would allow you to eat uh, maybe eggs from chickens that you, you, you know, you've seen the chickens, you're very happy with the lives that they've lived, you're, you know, you've, you've thoroughly investigated the possibility that there's no animal welfare issues at that farm. 
um, put in the effort to, to uh, find eggs that you're comfortable eating and remodel the ethics a little bit to allow that. Uh, otherwise, it's just, you know, have lower ectonic acid levels and, um, you know, deal with it. Or what is a source of, Pamela Schoenfield adds that, what is a source of ractonic acid in infant formula? I don't know off the top of my head. I really don't know. I think it's, it's, um, I would check out the arachidonic acid supplements and see if they're vegan. I, like, I, I don't, I don't know of any vegan natural source, but maybe there's a vegan synthetic source. I, I just genuinely don't know after that. Anonymous attendee says zinc of 100, of 800 and copper of 692 on the ion test, both in the low red, was taking 15 milligrams of zinc and one milligram of copper at the time of testing. Thoughts on what to increase the supplement level to in order to keep the correct ratio. Uh, I don't recommend looking at the zinc to copper ratio. Uh, I don't, I, I know that there are studies correlating health endpoints with the zinc to copper ratio, but I do not believe that it is a causal factor in disease. I believe the reason that the zinc to copper ratios are often associated with disease is because inflammation raises, uh, raises plasma copper and lowers plasma zinc based on um, taking zinc up into cells and mobilizing co stored copper out of the liver. And uh, I think you just want zinc and copper in not the ratios. I think you want them in the right levels. And um, zinc at 800, if I, you know, those units are different than what I'm used to. I believe that corresponds to 80 on a typical test. At 80, you're, you're not really deficient, but you'd probably be better off if you increased your zinc up by 10 or 20%. And your copper is, if I remember right, that's at the bottom of the range. And I really think copper, you want to be in the middle of the range. I don't think the bottom range of, of copper or zinc is adequate. And, um, you know, if you're taking that supplement, the simplest thing to do would be to take it twice a day instead of once a day. And also make sure you're taking it on an empty stomach. 50 milligrams of zinc in most people will not cause nausea on an empty stomach if you take it with a full glass of water. In some people it does. Um, but most people it doesn't. And if you can get away with taking it on an empty stomach, do so. And if you cannot, make sure that you are not taking it anywhere near phytate, which is found in whole grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes, and is the principal inhibitor of zinc absorption. So make sure the conditions are right. If the conditions are right, double the dose, check it again, triple the dose, check it again. Yeah, I know I know the units are PPB, Doug. Um, no, I know they are. I'm, I'm just saying, I, if I remember correctly, the PPB on the ion converts to uh, divided by 10 for the tip for the typical units. So, um, so anyway, make sure the supplement's taken correctly, double it or triple it and see what happens. Probably you need more copper from another source. I'm a bit like when I recommend Gero zinc balance, which, which has that, that exact ratio that you're talking about, maybe that's what you're taking. I recommend that for a zinc supplement, not for a copper supplement. And, um, and I think I just think it's a convenient way to have the copper in there in a way that makes the zinc safe without causing a deficiency. If someone is deficient in copper, that's not an adequate source of copper for two reasons. One, the copper amount is too low. And two, the form of copper in all copper supplements, almost all copper supplements, um, is is uh, is wrong. It's not the it's not the oxidation state that you get in food, and there's evidence in animal experiments that it's lower bioavailability. So for a copper supplement, I I would want to see food first, and if you want to supplement, I would supplement with liver capsules because liver capsule, you know, so ancestral it doesn't have to be that brand, but ancestral um, liver capsules at six a day are going to provide a very significant amount of copper, and it will be in the food form. Same thing if you were taking Oyster Max oyster capsules uh, this for zinc and copper. Like the amount is kind of low in those, but you keep taking them and you will, you will get a significant amount of copper in the right form. And then for foods, you know, uh, check out the, the tiers of copper rich foods that I recommend. So liver, cocoa powder, certain mushrooms. I'll put a link in the show notes to where I've laid out those copper rich foods. Kelly Armstrong says, thoughts on lowering my resting heart rate? It's often in the high 80s or low 90s once I'm up for the day. <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that. I'd use it for my heart rate. I don't even measure my heart rate because uh, 
my whole life it's been kind of high. Um, I, you know, I think breathing and meditation are probably the best things that you can do. I actually, I got, uh, I, I've, I've typically had a white coat response, a uh, white coat, white coat syndrome response to getting my blood pressure taken. And because as soon as I feel the pressure, um, I start to get anxiety and I'm like, oh no, it feels like it's high and, and, it, and it, I get an adrenaline rush. And a couple of years ago, I got rejected from giving blood three times in a year because my either my blood pressure or my pulse was too high when they measured it, both because of the adrenaline surge. And I was not able to donate blood until I started using Headspace, the meditation app. In particular, the visualizations of the happiness portion, which basically told you to imagine a ball of, of I think it was yellow light, like a spark in the middle of you that starts to expand and expand until it fills all of you. And then when it fills all of you, you start imagining it expanding to everyone in the house, everyone in your neighborhood, every, uh, everyone in your block, everyone in your neighborhood, and just out and out. And you get as far as you can through the universe until the meditation session ends. And while you're doing that, you imagine that everything that that light touches creates happiness in whatever it touches. It's like the Midas touch, but with happiness instead of gold. And um, the first time I was able to donate blood was when I went in to get my blood pressure and pulse taken. And I imagined that bright light in the middle of my chest. I just did the visualization thing and boom, like my, my heart rate, my pulse just went straight into, into normal zone because... I was able to, my brain created an association between that visualization and the state that the meditation produced that later allowed me to leverage that state. Not, I didn't have to do the meditation. I just used the image in my mind to bring that state up. So that'd be the first thing that I try. If I find out that I have a medical condition with a physiological solution, I'll let you know because I have the same thing. Anonymous attendee says, do you think a daily green smoothie with spinach or kale is a risk due to thallium, goitrogen, and oxalate content or other concerns? Off the top of my head, I don't know anything about the thallium content in these foods. Um, certainly goitrogen and oxalates are a concern. What I would do is, you know, I, some people might think that because it's a smoothie and it's raw, the goitrogens are more of a concern. I think the cooking thing is kind of overblown because if you cook kale, you're only neutralizing, uh, depends how you cook it. And it depends on your microbiome and stuff, but you're probably neutralizing like 30 to 60% of the goitrogens when you cook it. So it's really like the main problem with kale is overdosing on it. And spinach is kind of the same thing with the oxalates. Only with spinach, the only way to get rid of the oxalates is by leaching it into the cooking water and throwing the cooking water away. And when you eat it, anything with oxalate, if you eat calcium with it, the calcium will bind the oxalate. That will make the calcium less absorbable, but it will also make the oxalate less absorbable, which is a good thing. So um, the kale happens to have some calcium in it. And so the kale might protect against the spinach a little bit. Or including some dairy products in that would also help. In terms of the, whether the smoothie is harmful, it's about the dose. So the question is, why are you making a smoothie? If you're making a smoothie because you like the smoothie and you enjoy drinking the smoothie, and it's more enjoyable for you to drink the smoothie than it is to eat cooked kale and spinach, or if you're making the smoothie because it's faster and consumes less time, and it will be a more sustainable habit for you than cooking and eating spinach and kale, then I think that's fine. But if the reason you're making the smoothie is because you can juice or blend 10 times more kale than you would ever eat, I think that's a problem. So the smoothie versus eating the form is no concern to me at all. It's the dose. Are you using the smoothie to leverage an unrealistic dose of what you could eat from food? Then I think that's where you get into bad territory. But if those vegetables are blend at normal food doses in with other things, then I think that's fine. Chris Morell says, hey, Chris, we've consulted before about my homozygous H63D. I've noticed over the years, H63D, by the way, for those of you who are not familiar, is one of the genes that predisposes to hemochromatosis, a, a uh, 
condition of iron overload, and it is the weaker form of hemochromatosis. Most clinicians who work in this area do not consider the H63 allele to be a concern because it's less severe, but most people who are progressive on the iron research front do believe it's a concern. There is literature showing that people can get clinical hemochromatosis from it, and you don't have to get clinical hemochromatosis to be worried about iron overload. Chris and I are both Chris, <laughs> and we are also both H63D homozygous, meaning that we both have this moderately defective gene in iron regulation from both of our parents. Chris goes on, I've noticed over the course of the years, if I donate blood, my ferritin gets very low, around 30. But my snapshots of iron and transparent saturation can be anywhere between 30 and 55%. I finally saw a hematologist who basically said I should stop donating blood. He only concerns himself with ferritin because that's the data they use. He doesn't care about iron saturation. I asked him about risk of oxidizing cholesterol, but he's not versed on that. For people like me, do you still think getting that iron saturation range is important? Um, yeah, so look, my, my opinion on this is going to be different than someone who is an expert clinician but is not immersing themselves deeply in the physiological literature about how this works. And so, you know, I don't have the skills that they have in triaging and filtering who's ideal for what treatment and looking at large numbers of people that do one or another treatment and knowing intuitively what happens in those. But what I do have is I have immersed myself very deeply in the physiology. And so the way that I look at this is as follows. Iron saturation is an estimate of your transparent saturation. It's a cheaper way to, to, to estimate it than to actually measure transparent saturation. So it's much more common to get iron saturation. But let's assume that we're talking about actual transferrin saturation or that iron saturation is a good metric of it. That's your short-term iron storage. Ferritin is your long-term iron storage. The defect in the H63D allele, same for the C282Y allele of the HFE gene, the two moderate and severe hemochromatosis alleles. An allele is a type of, is a variant of a gene. So the, the problem with those two variants is that the, the uh, Actually, I should have explained this first. In normal physiology, what happens is transferrin acts as a gauge of your iron status. And the normal physiological levels are between 30 and 40%. Now, being 41% doesn't mean you have a disease. It's, we're not talking about diagnosis here. We're talking about understanding the physiology. Mechanistically, this is designed so that as you go from 30 to 40%, and especially as you go over 40%, that communicates the signal to a hormonal system that says you have more iron than you need. So you ramp down iron absorption and you ramp up ferritin. Why do you ramp up ferritin? Because you have more than you need in your short-term storage. So that's when you put it into your long-term storage. Also because ferritin is a protective response that prevents you from having free iron. Free iron is bad because it feeds pathogens and, it, and makes it can, infections worse. Free iron is bad because it causes oxidative stress and causes wear and damage on your tissues. And so to avoid free iron, you ramp up ferritin while you, down, while you take down your, your absorption from food at the same time. What's wrong in H63D and in C282Y alleles of the HFE gene that Chris and I have is that that communication system is somewhat impaired. And so what happens is that transferrin saturation goes up higher than it should be without kicking ferritin in. And this is a little bit counterintuitive because people are used to thinking as, of ferritin as the marker of the disease state. And so in their mind, you have the advanced disease state. You have the person who needs an artificial pacemaker. You have the person who needs a liver transplant in mind. And you think ferritin is a thousand. So high ferritin is the mark of a problem. But that's because we're not looking at what happens 30 or 40 years before the person needed an organ transplant. 30 or 40 years before the person needed an organ transplant was the transparent saturation went up and instead of ramping down intestinal iron absorption, you kept absorbing it from your food. Instead of ramping up ferritin, you let ferritin hang low. 
And so the transparent saturation going up higher than you would expect it to go and the ferritin being lower than you would expect it to be is the sign of the earliest physiological event that leads 30 or 40 years down the road to hemochromatosis. So I don't look at this as diagnosis because I'm not a healthcare practitioner. I'm not treating Chris's, Chris's iron issue. I'm not diagnosing anything. I'm looking at this from the perspective of what is physiologically happening. And so what I see when the transparent saturation is high and the ferritin is going down, that sounds like exactly what you would expect in the very earliest cases of iron overload. And now, is that a problem at all? You could debate that. But if you're just talking, if you're not talking about diagnosis and you're talking about wellness and you're talking about um, health management, then um, I don't know where Chris's question disappeared from my screen. I don't know. Um, it, when you're looking at it from the perspective of wellness, then to me, what I would want to do myself in that situation is I would, first of all, not let the ferritin go under 20. And if it's going near there, I would be getting a CBC to make sure I'm not making myself anemic, right? The worst case scenario is to become anemic. And you definitely should stop donating blood if you're anywhere near anemia. But if you are not anywhere near anemia, then you probably want the ferritin to be lower than you want it in almost anyone else because you might have iron that you need to deload from your tissues. And so I would not stop donating blood just because the ferritin is going down 60, 50, 40. I would, I would consider it a gray area. It would be my preference to focus on the transparent saturation and get it consistently under 40%. But I would not do that if it meant going anemic. I would not do that if it meant feeling like crap. But if I do that and I'm not anemic and I feel good or better, then I will absolutely keep doing that. And of course, if you're donating blood, then there are precautionary measures built in to make sure that you don't go anemic. Like you get the pinprick to look at your serum iron levels. They're not going to let you donate blood if you're actually in the danger zone of anemia. Um, so I would get the CBC to be proactive about it. But, you know, if, and I would not go totally unsupervised and start leeching my own blood. But yeah, if I get let in for the blood donation and they, I pass their screening process and I feel better after it and there's no signs of anemia, then I think with that background, that's, it's still a green light for blood donation. Uh, by the way, guys, um, if you have the ability to control your own question, please do not delete it or or market answered or anything like that while I'm responding to it um, because I need uh, I might need to look back at it and I want to make sure I have a written mark of all the questions. Guys, some people are leaving questions in the chat. Please repeat your question in the Q&A because I'm not looking over at the chat um, except in the case where um, I'm not looking over at the chat unless I'm expecting uh, someone to be responding to a question I'm talking about this time. Um, okay, anonymous attendee says B6, xanthorinate of 0.37, kinorinate of 1.4, both in their high red end on the ion test, taking 45 milligrams a day of B6 at time of test. Increased B6 further too. Um, anonymous, can you put in the chat whether you're a woman, whether you know anything about your estrogen levels, whether you are on uh, oral contraceptives, and whether you are menopausal or not, um, if you are, if you hear me and you can put that in the in the chat anonymously, that would be great. And I'll come back to your question if you do answer that, uh, and I'll move on for now. And um, uh, man, higher estrogen levels than normal. Uh, okay, estrogen. <laughs> so estrogen regulates the. What estrogen does is it increases the conversion of tryptophan to niacin, uh, to niacin. And my guess is that this is probably, a, is this is probably designed 
quote unquote, to increase niacin status in women, especially when they might have the opportunity to get pregnant or they actually get pregnant, to keep up with the energy demands of pregnancy and to support the niacin status of the baby. But it just so happens that um, there's no clear way for your body to know if you're a man and your estrogen levels are too high for a man, or if you're a woman and you're on oral contraceptives, it's just that that's what estrogen does. So you probably want to look at ways to reduce estrogen. Uh, I'm, I, right now, I'm extremely well-versed in niacin and, and fairly well-versed in tryptophan and very not well-versed in estrogen. So I don't know that I have a good explanation what to do about estrogen. Um, certainly, uh, alcohol is known to increase estrogen. Uh, I believe there are environmental toxins that can increase estrogen. Overweight will increase estrogen. I'm not sure off the top of my head what other things are relevant in the man. But I would definitely say that that's from the estrogen, especially if your plasma levels of pyridoxal 5-phosphate are normal. So I would follow it up with that test just to be sure. But it's almost certainly the estrogen increasing those. And um, there, just, there just isn't... Um, there just isn't good data on how to alter that in a way that um, there isn't good. So in, this is mostly studied in women, and it's mostly studied in the context of oral contraceptives. And the context of oral contraceptives, we know the oral contraceptives make these markers go into the urine, but no one has really shown how to fix that. So... I, what I would do with the B6 is I would be very careful about whether there is anything that responds to the B6. So first important thing is that if you have xantharinate and kynarinate out, the main risk of that actual fact of those spilling into your urine is actually that quinolinate would be building up. Quinolinate is usually the last thing to rise in B6 deficiency, you didn't mention quinolinate, quinolinate being elevated. And so quinolinate might not be elevated and you might not have problems. But quinolinate is an excitotoxin. It both can cause neurotoxicity like glutamate does, and it can also make you hypersensitive to glutamate. So it can effectively make you um, have glutamate sensitivity. And I have one client where she had very high levels of estrogen and she had very severe insomnia and 100 milligrams of pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which is the active form of B6, was it was one of the first things that actually moved the needle in her sleep. But it only lasted a couple of weeks, and the effects started wearing off. And um, so he clarifies that his quinolinate is in the fourth quintile. Okay, so you're in you're kind of in the zone where you're like, geez, the the quinolinate is um, might be a problem particularly if you have trouble sleeping or if you have um, trouble with anxiety or you have anything that you might, uh, you know, like Google glutamate sensitivity, headaches and other stuff like that. If you have any of those symptoms, that could be from quinolinate buildup. In that case, I would, my first line of defense against this would be to increase B6, possibly, I would titrate it up to 100 milligrams you're already at a P5P of uh, 45, so, so I wouldn't more than double that. Um, and um, uh, so, okay, someone's asking, how did anonymous attendee insert dozen questions ahead of mine? Um, I don't know. I think that I'm going in order here, but there might be something wrong with my order. Uh, unfortunately, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to disrupt the flow too much because I don't want to run out of time on this, and I think I can get to everyone. Um, but oh, orders! Oh, people are upvoting. That's why. Okay, um, I think I'll get to everyone, and so I'm, I just want to go through this straight and. Uh, definitely, if it feels like we're going to run out of time, I will start being more selective with what I answer. But I want to finish this. So, um, okay, so B6 markers spilling out into the urine. 
quinolinate is the primary concern because it's neurotoxic. If there are any signs that you would associate with excessive glutamate, then, um, then that's where I would be concerned. I would go on symptoms, increasing the B6 to 100 milligrams. I'd be very cautious going higher than that, even on symptoms. I probably wouldn't stress that too much. My second choice of action would be to lower the tryptophan content of the diet because that's what's spilling over into the quinolinate. Um, oh, iron and riboflavin are also involved in that same pathway. In theory, in theory, these are B6 markers, but maybe in some people, if iron or riboflavin are particularly limiting and B6 isn't, maybe these are indicating a need for those nutrients. Okay, so, so first course of action is leverage up the B6 to the, the optimum point where there's no negative symptoms and you, you are getting a benefit from higher doses managing the symptoms. Don't go up to higher doses if they're not helping managing symptoms. Don't go over 100 milligrams of P5P. Don't take any pyridoxine hydrochloride ever. Second course of action is look at iron and B6 levels. If there's any things wrong with those, fix them. Third course of action is, if necessary, reduce protein intake or search for low tryptophan proteins and focus on those to meet your protein needs, providing that you don't go too low. You're going to need at least a few hundred milligrams of tryptophan in your diet to be okay. Um, all of this is secondary to managing the estrogen, which is the root, probably the root cause here. All right. Thank you for your question. Uh, anonymous attendee says beta hydroxy isovalerate 9.8 on the ion test and the high red. That's a marker of biotin deficiency. Taking 1300 micrograms of biotin at the time of testing, increased B7 further too. Um, well, in theory, that's a marker of biotin deficiency, but you might have a defect in a biotin dependent enzyme. So you can try five milligrams, but if you still have high beta hydroxy isovalerate, you need to start looking at a metabolic disorder, probably. Um, providing their symptoms, right? Because you might have a 20 or you might have a 20% decrease in that enzyme activity. And maybe it has the capacity to cause symptoms, but they don't manifest. Um, and you might not be able to do anything about it. But that's what I would be looking at next if, if five milligrams of biotin doesn't affect that. Anonymous attendee says vitamin E, alpha tocopherol, 15.5, but gamma tocopherol on edge of green at 0.37 on ion test. To, Doug, is this all you? <laughs> is this all the same person? Uh, vitamin E, alpha tocopherol, 15.5, but gamma tocopherol on edge of green at 0.37 on the ion test, taking 100 IU of E at the time of the test. Also have some SNP, which has been shown to have a negative, which shown that vitamin E has a negative impact with that SNP. I don't know that snip off the top of my head. Add gerotocoserb or not. Um, but gamma to coferol, um, the alpha to coferol is fine, right? Your problem is the gamma to coferol is not, I don't, I don't understand the, the problem here. So, um, reply, reply specifically what's wrong with the test and I'll come back to it. My initial impression is there's nothing wrong because I don't particularly care that much about gamma tocopherol on edge of green point. Yeah, I mean, look, my my laboratory and my doctoral research specialize in gamma tocopherol. And look, there's some evidence that gamma tocopherol does some things that alpha tocopherol doesn't do. But there's like it's mainly what is a good hypothesis is that people who take high dose alpha tocopherol supplements are suppressing their gamma tocopherol levels, um, you know, but, but not like the lead, the, the good hypothesis isn't that everyone has to be in the middle of the green on the ion range in gamma tocopherol. So if you are taking 100 IU at the time of test and it's alpha tocopherol, um, then, you know, stop taking that and replace it with the tocozorb or take a lower dose. I think a, a, a reasonable IU um, of vitamin E for the average person to take is like 20 IU. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to some of the named uh, people just to make sure that we're randomizing what, um, 
who's getting in here, and I'll come, I'll come back up to the anonymous questions in a little bit. Stephen Smith asks, can you explain how to properly interpret the Randall cycle? There's a theory floating around on the internet that mixed diets are more fattening than low carb or low fat because of the glucose fatty acid competition. I don't believe this to be true because in the context of isochloric diets, neither mixed diets nor low carb, low fat diets seem to be particularly fattening. Yeah, in the context of isochloric diets, <laughs> but in real life, and look, so I got into a fight, not a fight, but like I got a lot of blowback on Twitter um, about this last night and the day before talking about fatty liver disease. Isocaloric diets are important to your cause and effect understanding the physiology, but they interfere with your real life practical understanding of something. So yes, we want to use isochloric diets to study the academic question of physiologically, are carbon fat more, more um, fattening when combined than not combined? But in real life, people eat more in a mixed diet than they eat on a low fat or low carb diet. So it's, so the, I, I think um, someone who says they're more fattening because of the Randall cycle is totally misunderstanding this. They are more fattening because of the hyperpalatability factors that Stephen Guillen has explained. They probably are more likely to cause metabolic harm because of what Alex Leaf has explained about the Randall cycle in his post. Um, I don't remember what it was called, but if you Google Alex Leaf butter potato, it should come up. He was arguing that you don't want to put butter on your potato because you have substrate competition and you wind up making it more difficult to clear the glucose and you require a higher insulin response. I'm not so insulinocentric that I believe that you necessarily always want to be minimizing your insulin response. And I definitely know that I have friends and colleagues who disagree with me on that, but I just don't view um, any disease, including, um, including type 2 diabetes, I don't really view it as, as, a, as hyperinsulinemia is the problem. But um, look, the, the short of it is the more you mix carbs and fat in your diet, the more likely you are to overeat. You don't necessarily overeat, but it's way more probable because it's hyperpalatable. The more you mix carbs and fat, the more you, you um, don't specialize in one or the other. What's the most efficient thing to do? Division of labor. Division of labor is why we're talking over the internet. The internet would not exist without division of labor because humans would not be efficient enough. And division of labor is why you guys pay me some subscription money and then I just sit in this office for 12 hours a day reading about nutrients and then talk to you about it, right? Because that's way more efficient than, all, than everyone out here going and reading all the same stuff. So, it, I mean, it's totally the same thing in your body. If you eat a high-carb, low-fat diet, your body specializes in burning in high-carb, low-fat. Your body specializes in burning carbs. You eat a, a high-fat, low-carb diet, your body specializes in burning fat. And you're not going to do either of those as good as if you're, eating, if you're eating a mixed diet. Can you do them good enough? Oftentimes. But if you have metabolic problems, you might want to try a low-carb or a low-fat diet so you can specialize and be more efficient with your metabolism. Because if you have metabolic problems, whatever you're doing isn't working for you right now. Um, okay. Oh, that's where, oh, I see. Uh, Chris Morell's um, question disappeared while I was answering it because it got upvoted by other questions and now it's here. Okay, I answered this one, done. Um, Sonia says, I have a five-year-old who is unusually easily exhausted and I'm wondering if there is a nutritional basis to it. It's my understanding that many of the FDA nutritional standards for children are based on scaled down adult levels. Yeah, almost every RDA for children above six months or at least above a year is based by body weight scaling down of adult values, which I think is... I just, I think it's nuts because an adolescent in a growth spurt is not going to eat, is not going to eat nutrients proportional to their body weight compared to yours. They're going to 
need, I think they should have adjusted them all down for energy intake because there's no data for either, right? Like there's no data justifying body weight adjustment or data justifying calorie adjustment, except in some cases there is data for calorie adjustment. There's never any data for body weight adjustment. And, and so what you wind up with is you wind up with someone who's half the body size eating twice the amount of food and you're making an RDA that says that it's okay for them to eat a diet that has one fourth the nutrient density, right? Like that's what it, that's what it means, right? If you say your needs are half as much, but you eat twice as much food, you're saying that the minimal requirement is to eat a diet that's four times less nutrient dense for your child than what you're eating. That's nuts. Weston Price, one of the thing, one of the points that he made was that all the traditional diets, when he went around the world in the 1930s as a pioneer in nutritional anthropology, all the health promoting traditional diets provided about four times the nutrients that you would expect anyone to need. His point wasn't that we all need that much. His point was that in the traditional wisdom, they ate such an excess of nutrients over minimal needs that when they became pregnant, when they started lactating, when they were growing as a child, they could hit a growth spurt and, they, and it didn't matter. They could get pregnant and it didn't matter. They could start lactating and it didn't matter. So the... Um, okay, I am going to turn off uh, upvoting on this because almost no questions are getting more than one vote. And what's happening is the upvoting is messing with the order of the question and I'm losing it while I'm replying to it. Um, let me, hopefully I can keyword, no. Uh, okay, I'll try to pull this question up. So uh, anyway, so for children, I believe that, I believe that children are likely to need um, more nutrients when they're going through growth spurts. I will try to find, um, I'll try to find that question and come back to it if, um, if I do, but I might, I might have, to, I might not be able to find it very easily, very quickly. Uh, by the, oh, so if I was just responding to your question, you want to copy and paste it into the chat, then that would be a great way for me to see. Oh, okay. I found it. Okay. Sonia, your five-year-old is unusually easily exhausted. I'm wondering if there's a nutritional basis to it. It's my understanding that the, that the, the FDA nutritional standards. So those are usually, but not always somewhat related to the RDAs. Those are the daily values that like, I would ignore those. Like, why would you pay any attention to the FDA on nutrition when you have the food and nutrition board of the Institute of Medicine giving you, um, giving you hard science, right? Um, so like FDA, USDA, uh, for, for, for nutrition, for nutrition, right? Uh, I, like I'm not ignoring the FDA on, you know, if a drug is, is safe to use during pregnancy or something like that. But how much vitamin A should I eat? I'm, I, I'm not accepting dogmatically the Institute of Medicine, but I care what the Institute of Medicine says. And I don't care what the FDA or the USDA says. Um, scale down from adult needs that do not account for children's unique metabolic needs makes sense. Please describe best practices in testing and managing nutritional status in young children. Well, unfortunately, there are no age-appropriate ranges for any of these things. I mean, too often, we don't even have good adult ranges. So testing nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet, you can use that for children. You have to be aware that the, val the ranges might not always be the best ranges for children, but what it allows you to do is say, okay, if my child is out of the range on this one thing and my child is in the range on everything else, then I don't know that the range works perfectly for them, but I not, now I have myself pointed in the appropriate direction to look. But it's not necessarily nutritional. I mean, the, the person is five years old and, and being, unusual, being easily exhausted is... Um, you know, could be an energy, uh, a disorder of energy metabolism. And um, you get a, you get a, if you do an organic acids and amino acids test, you'd certainly have a first good look, not only into comprehensive nutritional screening, but you, you would start to get um, 
you'd start to get a, a, a first look into possibilities of other things going wrong in the metabolism. Pam asks um, on the tails of this question, why did the FDA have a value for vitamin A for pregnancy of much higher at 8,000 IU than the IOM in the past? I have no idea. I, I mean, I just said I don't pay any attention to the FDA. I, that's a research project, but, um, but like, look, the, so I, what I do know is that the concerns around pregnancy for vitamin A are that in the first weeks of pregnancy, 10,000 IU and higher has been associated with birth defects. That was one study in 1995 that, uh, con that was a prospective study, which is higher quality, but contradicted all the re retrospective studies that came to the opposite conclusion. So there's not good consensus on the data. There's just moderately justifiable paranoia about the possibility that you could hurt, that you could cause a birth defect. And, and there were, you know, if you go back to that 1995 study, somewhere in the Weston A. Price Journal, I wrote about this, uh, probably nutrition for fetal development. There's a sidebar on it. If you Google my name, the nutrition for fetal development is probably there. Um, there were like seven or eight letters to the editor about why that study had a bunch of problems with it. Like the data just didn't make sense. So the, the um, basis for restricting A in pregnancy, if that might be what you're referring to, is um, it's a theoretical concern that doesn't have a lot of data to support it. Then again, I see no reason why someone needs necessarily 10,000 IU or more going into the first eight weeks of pregnancy I mean, so, like if you eat liver once or twice a week, you're not getting more than that. If you took a half a teaspoon of cod liver oil every day, you're not getting more than that. If you eat eggs and dairy every day, you're not getting more than that. So I would not supplement with 10,000 IU and higher vitamin A going into pregnancy because, not because I'm super paranoid and there's good, justify, good data justifying the restriction, but just because the theoretical concern outweighs the lack of theoretical benefit in most cases for mo most women. Now, if that woman is in is trying to get pregnant, but her serum retinol is low and her eyes are dry and her night vision is bad and she has hyperkeratosis, then you bend the rule a little bit because you have an obvious justification to get her vitamin A levels up. But if there's no such problem and there's no reasonable theoretical benefit of taking 20,000 IU leading into pregnancy, why would you do it? Um, it's just... You know, speculation versus speculation, but like, why not pave the middle ground of what you would reasonably get from food? Thoughts on monitoring HRV for optimizing performance. I answered this in the last AMA and, well, actually, I didn't answer this exact question. I answered a similar question. Um, so yeah, monitor it with the Oura Ring. I don't have an Oura Ring. I'll probably get one, but I, but that's what I would use. And, um, and what I would do is when you get a good way to measure your HRV, you measure it every night and you stop exercising entirely. And you wait to see when does your HRV plateau. In theory there's a good probability that you're a little overtrained, especially if you've been exercising recently, or that you're just not fully recovered from your last workout. So your goal is to establish a baseline. You get your HRV every day, you completely stop working out. You don't go, oh no, I'm gonna lose my muscle mass. Oh no, like nothing's gonna happen for a week or two. And this is the whole foundation of you having good data. You get your baseline, you see, in theory, my HRV is gonna go up. If it goes up, when does it stop going up? When do I have like three days where it went up, it hit a maximum and it just never went up any further? You assume that's your baseline. Now you start working out. You do one workout that's, that's typical. You keep taking your HRV. You probably see your HRV plummet. Then you say, how long does it take me to recover on my current diet and lifestyle? Then you repeat that. Like you don't work out again until it's back up to the plateau level. Then you work out again and you see if you have a repeatable response where there's a certain amount of time on average that's fairly replicable that it takes you to recover your, your peak HRV after your typical workout. 
Then when you have that, you get on that frequency. Then what you do is you start playing around with factors like, does it matter what type of workout I do? Is my recovery level consistently different when I lift weights at five reps per set versus 15 reps per set? Is my recovery time consistently different when I do cardio or when I do cardio and weights on the same day or when I play soccer? Then you start to tailor your recovery time around the specific workout. Maybe it takes you two days to recover from one workout and four days to recover from another. Lower body, upper body. If you have a lower body, upper body split, does it take me five days to recover from lower body? And does it take me three days to recover from upper body? And so then you start tweaking diet and lifestyle. Do I recover faster if I eat more carbs? Do I recover faster if I eat food X? Do I recover faster if I take supplement X? Always testing one thing at a time and making sure it's replicable before you form a conclusion and before you do the next test. Uh, no, we're not low on time. We, we got we got till five o'clock. I can probably go a little bit over. Okay. Um, Victoria Dale Harris says, can you explain what parent essential oils are? <laughs> Are there functional, are there function in cell membrane health? I was given, but haven't not read yet some articles that seem to be saying that high dose cold water fish oils are damaging cell membrane health and mitochondrial function. Perrin essential oil is a term invented by this guy, Brian Peskin, who um, I think he has a good reason for why he thinks what he thinks. And I think he has good concerns, but I think that he, is wrong. So, um, oh, Stephen, I see your your hand is raised. Uh, if you still want to, I'm not sure how long you've had it raised. If you still want to ask a question, keep it up, and I'll call on you next. Um, if not, look, please lower your hand if you if you don't want to ask a live question. Um, so, okay, so Brian Peskin basically looked at the the data that said, look, it's not clear at all that supplementing fish oil is good for you. Because doing so can cause oxidative stress and cause damage to cells. That's true. And that's because the highly unsaturated oils found in fish oil, even found in liver and egg yolks, the omega-3 and omega-6 essential, physiologically essential fatty acids, arachidonic acid and DHA are the two that are physiologically essential. Those are highly vulnerable to being damaged. And so it's true that if you get too much, you get damage. Um, what I think he's wrong on is that he has taken that data and said, no, you don't want these oils. You want a lot of flax oil. You want a lot of, I'm, I don't remember which oils he uses, but he's saying you want a lot of the parent essential oils. And the parents are the plant fatty acids that can be converted in to, to arachidonic acid and DHA. And so those are oils like, again, I don't know if he recommends these specific oils, but those are oils like flax oil, like uh, soybean oil, canola oil, like, you know, all those things that provide omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids that can be converted into the longer chain forms. My problem with that is that it is true that a high intake of the products, the son and daughter oils, if you want to call them that, is damaging. It's also true that a high intake of the parent oils is damaging or it's, none of them are damaging. It's just they create a, a liability for possible damage because like, it's not damaging to eat fish or to take fish oil, but you put, those, you put the fish oil fatty acids in your membranes and it, if something comes along that damages the membrane, it does more damage because of the fish oil fatty acids there. Same thing is true with all the parent oils. It's just to a lesser degree. But to a lesser degree, does that make them safe? Yeah, gram for gram. Yeah, it's probably, you know, you could argue that it, that if you meet your needs for, for DHA and arachidonic acid, that it's better to have an extra gram of alpha linolenic acid from flax oil than it is to have an extra gram of EPA and DHA over and above beyond what could possibly give you any health benefit. But when, you, when you're talking about using those oils in the diet to get the EPA or the DHA, some people say EPA. I don't, I'm not a fan of EPA as much. The, maybe EPA, definitely the DHA and the arachidonic acid. We've got to consume a lot of them. 
And so all of a sudden, your total number of vulnerable fatty acids, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, the PUFAs, is way higher than it would be if you took a small amount of the DHA and arachidonic acid. So I would recommend just taking a small amount of the arachidonic acid and, and, and DHA, since at least you know that it's there with genetics and hormones and health. You don't even know if you're making a conversion otherwise. So look, I think, you know, I think high dose fish oil is ridiculous. I think five, six, seven, eight grams of EPA and DHA is nuts. You know, we'll lower triglycerides in people with really high triglycerides. Not denying that. But as a means of nourishment or as a means of getting it preemptively or as, as a means of anything other than treating, medically treating high triglycerides, it makes no sense and it's risky. It's potentially harmful. Brian Peskin's right. Where I differ from Brian Peskin is he says, get the parent oils. I say, get small amounts of the physio physiological essential fatty acids that you would get if you ate fish once or twice a week and if you ate liver once a week and if you ate egg yolks on average, one, two, three a day. You get plenty of them. Um, Stephen, you are, uh, you're, um, you're on the mic. Stephen, you, you want just the mic or you want the uh, video chat? Are you there, Stephen? Uh, okay, I think, Stephen, I think you, you uh, left. So I'm going to lower your hand, raise your hand again if you want to get in, uh, if you want to get on the mic. Hello? Oh. Oh. Stephen. Hey. Stephen? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, do you want uh, just audio or you want it, uh, video too? Oh, uh, we can do video. Okay. Um, I have promoted you to panelist. Do we see Stephen say something? Stephen, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hey. Hey, there you go. Okay. What's up? All right. Yeah, so I just wanted to respond to the, the question about the Randall cycle. Okay. Um, because there's a, a few people on the internet right now that have YouTube channels that are talking about the Randall cycle. And that's okay. what's, they're claiming that that's what's made um, America fat because we all eat a mixed diet. And part of me agrees with this because, yes, we've, you know, a diet that is mixed is hyper palatable. However, personally, I've tried very low carb diets. I've tried very um, low fat diets and I feel awful on both. And so for me, a diet with like meat and potatoes and fruit uh, and vegetables um, with about 30% protein, 30% fat and 40% carbs, that's where I feel best. And, um, I can control my... Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Um, are, what kind of meat are you eating and how much added fat do you have? Because I feel like unless you're eating very lean meats, it would be fairly easy to hit 30% fat without adding fat to your diet, without adding added oils. Um, well... It's from butter and olive oil and stuff that's added in. Sure. I mean, I don't really add a lot of fat to my, to my meats. It's mostly just like... Just steak and Not lean. to the meat, but to the other foods, like the vegetables and the and the potatoes. Like, um, are you are you uh, are you adding like butter to the potato and olive oil to the only, vegetables? Only a tiny bit. I don't really. I can eat so them. Most, so most of your fat is is in the natural foods, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, there's. I just think that the. I think, like I said before, I think the theory. I guess you're, you're asking a little bit more about the practical question of, of what's good to do now. I think the theory is just wrong. Like it's Randall cycle addresses why you would have elevated fatty acids or glucose, because if you're out competing, if you're, if your fatty acids are out competing glucose, you're going to have hyperglycemia or you're going to require more insulin than you'd otherwise require to, to bring that glucose into the cells and vice versa, right? So you're more likely to have circulating energy supplies in your blood due to poor tissue uptake, when you're consuming these things together, you're more likely to be more dependent on a higher insulin response. That's primarily related to the metabolic outcome. It doesn't mean that mixing them causes diabetes. It just means that there is more substrate competition and all things equal. If one person's on the edge of diabetes, if two people are right on the edge of diabetes and one 
eats a mixed diet, there's a higher probability that they're going to go over that edge because of the substrate competition contributing to the hyperglycemia and the greater insulin requirement than someone who's on a low carb or low fat diet. But that doesn't mean that a mixed diet is bad or that it's not optimal for you. So first of all, if you're not, if you have no evidence of metabolic dysfunction on, on a mixed diet, then there's no issue. Second of all, getting fat, like that, that's kind of the same error that the low, that the, uh, the sort of Tobzian carb centric view of, of body fat gain is making, which is the idea that the glycemic response or the insulin is going to be what makes you fat when actually the caloric balance is what makes you fat. And, um, you know, that like there's, there's a little bit of truth in the carb, carb centric or well, the carbohydrate hypothesis of obesity. There's an element of truth in that some people are going to have blood sugar dysregulation on a carb heavy diet that leads them to eat more food because their blood sugar fluctuations are so great that hyperinsulinemia is driving them to eat more. Like there's probably a subset of people for whom that's a factor, but overwhelmingly that is not the main cause of obesity. And to say the Randall cycle is the cause of obesity is making the exact same error because it's focusing on the glycemic response and the insulin response instead of the overall caloric balance. What makes you fat is eating too much food. Um, you know, the, the only, the only, the only, um, the only thing that you should change about the calories in calories out hypothesis on a practical level is to say that it tells you very little about the behavioral modifications that someone needs to make to sustain a caloric deficit over time. And so you must have, um, you must engage with what are the possible effects of all those diets plus all the habits and lifestyle and mindsets and everything that plays into eating behavior, all of that exists and it, and it causes nuance. Um, and, then, and then nutrient partitioning is affected by protein and exercise in a way that says for any given caloric balance, how much goes into fat storage, how much goes into muscle building. Other than that, like that's, that's it, right? So why did people get fat? I don't think we need to hash out the whole thing here. Like I, I'll just largely endorse Stefan Guillain's view. It's basically the proliferation of hyperpalatable food. A mixed diet leverages the principle of creating a hyperpalatable diet by mixing carbs and fat, but your diet doesn't sound hyperpalatable. You're not, you're not telling me, you know, like compare what you're eating to what a, what, to an Oreo cookie. Okay, the sure. Oreo cookie is saying, I need this amount of sweetness. I need this amount of creaminess. I need this amount of crunch. I need this amount of like take out a little bit of bitter in this compound, like just mix it together to make you eat more. Or at least potato chip has the carb, the fat, and the salt in just the right proportion and the mouthfeel and the texture, the baking temperature, the glycation products with the little browning to make you bet you can eat just one. It's not, it's not like the percent carbs and fat that's doing that. It's the way that they're combined. It's the mouthfeel. It's the texture. It's the salt. It's the ratios. It's that stuff. You, like eating the natural fats of meat with vegetables with a small amount of fat added will bring the percent up, but it's just not hyperpalatable. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. And I'm just going to say one more thing. Um, I agree with, with that 100%. And uh, the, the couple people that are, are parroting this idea that, um, the Randall cycle caused, causes obesity are completely ignoring the hyperpalatability aspect. And they're just saying that it's the mixing of fat and carbs and the competition and the Randall yeah, cycle. That's, 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 that's why I wanted to bring this up. Yeah, way off, way off. All right, thanks, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next question. Vic, uh, Victoria Dale Harris says, I just saw an email from Matt Stone referring to the overly deified. <laughs> oh, someone had to bring this up. Okay. I just saw an email from Matt Stone referring to the overly deified nutrient. Um, <laughs> 
vitamin A. He's referring to its probable role in asthma, but writes, I believe the etiology of the condition could be nearly identical to the etiology of many, if not most, inflammatory conditions. Also, a few bloggers are starting to spread the word, specifically Weston A. Price Foundation bloggers who are sick of really shitty results on a, now I have to mark this explicit in iTunes, really shitty results on a high A diet. Any thoughts about this and comments about vitamin A toxic levels? Pamela Schoenfeld responds, for what it's worth, as a practicing dietitian, I see a high percentage of individuals with signs of vitamin A deficiency, at least 25%, and I see good outcomes with daily supplementation between 3,000 and 10,000 IU. Okay, um, the, that comment did not go where I thought it was going to go, which is to the guy that Matt Stone is being influenced by right now about the vitamin A toxicity. Um, so I'll save that for another time when someone brings that guy up. Okay, so look, I think that... Um, yeah, you shouldn't deify any nutrient, right? There's any point of view that breaks the world down into, um, into good and bad molecules is a doomed to failure point of view because molecules don't have virtues, okay? Like everything is about context and too much vitamin A which cannot be defined outside of context, not just what are your needs are, not just what are your genetics, not just what is your turnover rate, not just what are your eye color, not just are you getting pregnant, but also the presence of other things in the diet. For example, vitamin D. For example, even vitamin E and K will affect the, the vitamin A requirement because they all uh, regulate each other's breakdown. So look, some people have too much vitamin A. Some people take more vitamin A than they should. There's dozens of case reports of vitamin A toxicity, but there's no evidence that people at normal intakes who are not supplementing are getting inflammation from consuming dietary levels of vitamin A. And look at what, what Pam said. I see uh, 25% of people who she sees and that every practitioner does not see a random sample of population. So every, like me, her, Chris Kresser, like anyone pick them, they are, their sample is highly biased by the people who choose to come to them. Um, but 25%, she sees signs of vitamin A deficiency that respond to vitamin A supplementation. That's a, that's a fairly large proportion. But look at the amounts she's using. 3,000, 10,000 IU is not a lot. The RDA is 3,000. If you're correcting the deficiency, 10,000 is highly reasonable over a short period of time. And, um, you know, but look, if you have someone who has a very long history of taking vitamin A supplements at 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 IU over, over three years, then, uh, yeah, they might have all kinds of problems from that because they're taking too much. And that's way more likely when they're not taking vitamin D when they're not taking vitamin E, when they're not taking vitamin K, if you're taking this one vitamin at a very high dose, yes, it will cause toxicity. There's nothing remotely controversial about that. No reason to question it. And there are probably a lot of people in Weston A. Price who think that more of a good thing is better and who are taking, hey, I know for a fact that many people were taking two or three tablespoons of high vitamin cod liver oil for many years. and um, and that was nuts. <laughs> and it's nuts now. And they're getting too many fat soluble vitamins and too many polyunsaturated fatty acids from high levels of cod liver oil like that. But three to 10,000 IU, even long term, there's no evidence that that causes toxicity. But some people are going to be intolerant. I know anecdotes, I know stories of people who, for some reason, they take vitamin A at very low doses and it causes some hypersensitivity reaction. I don't know what causes it. So, there will be stories of people who improve when they take the vitamin A out of their diet. It will happen. It makes sense. And on top of that, there are epidemic proportions of people with fatty liver. What happens when fatty liver gets bad? The cells that store vitamin A in the liver dump their vitamin A into the bloodstream so they can transform into cells that lay scar tissue down in the liver. So people with fatty liver, which is about three quarters of people who are obese, right? So about 70 million Americans, maybe more now, have 
fatty liver disease. Some proportion of them are laying down scar tissue in their livers and they are, and they are uh, losing the ability to properly store and metabolize vitamin A. Could taking vitamin A out of the diet for them help? Probably, but it's a very, um, it's a very, it's a, it's a tough place to be in because in those cases, those people are, are going to have cellular vitamin A deficiency. So it's like, do you save the liver or do you save everything else? Well, you might want to withdraw vitamin A in those cases, and you might want to fix the obesity and the fatty liver disease and then restore the vitamin A. That might be needed. But uh, I have no problem saying that vitamin, some people get too much vitamin A. Vitamin A can be toxic. But vitamin A, is, there are some people going around right now that are saying that vitamin A is a toxin and it's intrinsically in to- toxic. And those people are, are truly, absolutely nuts. I don't, I'm not saying that's Matt Stone. I don't know if he's saying that. But there are, there are, it's becoming very popular to say that. That is, um, that's, that's flat earth level uh, thinking that it's just intrinsically toxic and not a vitamin. Okay. Um, Okay, Sonia has a follow up. Thank, thank you for the for what I had previously said. Um, I'll check out the ultimate cheat sheet and look for values that are proportionally out of range from the adult values. This is going back to the question about the child with, with unusual fatigue. I'm still confused about those might need to be proportionally different. I'll well, yeah, they might need to be, but there's not much you can do because there's there's um, there's there's just there aren't childhood-based ranges that, that are data-driven. I'll re-listen to your answer later to see if there is something I missed. I also pay special attention to organic acids and amino acids. The kids are tricky due to picky eating. Uh, you know, one thing I'd add here is that, so what if the ranges are, are need to be a little bit different in children? The approach in the cheat sheet is not to rely exclusively on the ranges. It's also to look at the diet and lifestyle analysis and to look at the signs and symptoms. So what you do is you piece together does the diet and lifestyle analysis, the blood lab, and the signs and symptoms all say deficiency X, too much Y? Then that's very good information. And what you do is you intervene on the basis of what seems probable and you monitor the outcome. So you're not making an assumption on the blood range and it's okay that the blood range might not give you the exact right information. Um. Okay, I'm going to go backwards up from the bottom now. Chris Morell has a follow-up. Chris, are there diminishing returns to the amount of fish in a weekly diet? I know you mentioned eating fish about twice a week. I've been trying to eat salmon once a day. Is there an ideal ratio of fish to non-fish meat protein we should aim for? There is not a lot of back data backing that up. Um, and the data we have is pretty poor quality. But I'm of the mind that the diminishing returns come after one or two servings of, of fatty fish per week. I think if you're talking about white fish, it's different. But I mean like salmon or mackerel. Uh, I think once a week or twice a week is good. I think diminishing returns occur after that. I think if you're talking about white fish, you can, it's, it's uh, not as different from meat as you might think. The real big difference in my view is there are some different, like selenium and iodine and things are different, but, uh, the, but the big difference in salmon, mackerel, and other fatty fish versus lean fish versus meat, you're, it's mainly the fish fat that I'm concerned about. Philippa Antel says, what are the best ways to optimize glutathione status for someone who has a G6PD deficiency? Oh, um, I read about this. Where did I read about it? I believe it was riboflavin. I believe, and I don't think I mentioned this in episode 58 of the riboflavin podcast, but um, I believe it might have been the case that riboflavin was shown to be of benefit for normalizing oxidative stress in people who have glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. So for people who don't know what this is, G6PD or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is an enzyme that you use to take energy from glucose specifically. You can't take it from anything else and you use it to recycle glutathione, which is a master antioxidant of the cell. You also need this to support the recycling of vitamin K and folate. And 
you need this for synthesis of neurotransmitters and a bunch of other stuff. But the big problem with G6PD deficiency is that you can have, I don't know, this isn't the only problem. I think a lot of things are going to go wrong when you can't use this pathway, like I just said. But the big thing that people, are, that people usually use as, as the hallmark is that the red blood cells become more vulnerable to hemolysis. And that is a result of oxidative stress from poor glutathione recycling in the red blood cell. So what, one of the adaptive responses to having glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency is that the glutathione reductase enzyme, which is the enzyme that uses riboflavin and niacin to recycle glutathione with the energy taken from glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, that enzyme, glutathione reductase, it, it develops a voracious appetite for riboflavin that makes the all the riboflavin that would go anywhere else gets sucked up into that enzyme. So basically, you become very dependent on riboflavin support of glutathione reductase because you have lost uh, G6PD, the enzyme that's involved in passing the energy on to riboflavin and glutathione reductase. And I would tr I would try... I I would start with look. There's probably no harm to starting at 400 milligrams of riboflavin a day, but if you feel like you want to be more cautious about it, I'd start at five or ten milligrams a day. Test the effect on uh, on glutathione status. In the, you know, in this case, I think you want to look at erythrocyte glutathione status. I don't don't usually recommend that test, but it might be a more relevant test specifically for this condition. Um. Even though in general, what I would usually recommend for glutathione status would be would be plasma levels of glutathione, um, or actually LabCorp has I think LabCorp does whole blood glutathione. That might be I don't remember what LabCorp's test is, but you, um, you might not have infinite options here. Anyway, whatever you're testing glutathione with, I would I would first and foremost look at high dose riboflavin, maybe in the moderate high dose range of five to 10 milligrams, maybe in the high, high dose range of one to 400 milligrams and see if that helps. Anonymous says, what's the meaning of very high three methyl glutaric acid measured on the organic acids test? Um, that's three methyl, not three hydroxymethyl. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. I... Uh, a lot like this is something I very rarely see, and so I usually look back at my notes on it. I think that's coming out of leucine and ketone metabolism, unless you're talking about hydroxymethylglutaric acid, in which case um, it might not. That yeah, I, I'm not sure. I would look at whether glutaric acid is high because if glutaric acid is high, maybe it's feeding into that pathway, in which case riboflavin. Um, or a, or a, that would be another case for high dose riboflavin supplementation. Um, but if it's the three methyl, I don't remember for sure. Anonymous says, I'm a 60 year old female who's, I'm a 60 year old female whose lipid profile changed after three months of 250 milligrams of berberine. While all levels went down significantly, cholesterol 253 to 199, trigs 93 to 74, LDL 144 to 104, LPLA 31 to 22. Why would my apolipoprotein B go up from 129 to 190? What concerns should I have? I know who this is. Okay. Um, so first of all, the, what the ApoB means is it's an indirect measure of how many particles you have. If you have, uh, there's one ApoB molecule for every LDL particle. And if you have high ApoB, it means you have a high number of LDL particles. So if you were to get an LDL particle count, that would be high. If you were to get an LDL cholesterol pattern, you would probably see that you are more likely to have the small dense LDL rather than the large fluffy LDL. So it's pattern B instead of pattern A. And that's simply because if you have the same amount of cholesterol and higher numbers of particles, 
or in this case, you have lower cholesterol and higher particle numbers, then that cholesterol must be contained in a larger number of smaller particles. So the small dense LDL is, is you know, if you hold LDL cholesterol con- constant, then the small dense LDL is bad and the large fluffy LDL is worse. If you don't hold LDL constant, it's not clear which one's better. So the total cholesterol looks better. The uh, I don't see HDL here. So the total cholesterol looks better. The trigs I don't care about really in that at those numbers. The LDL looks better. Probably the total the HDL cholesterol by inference since HDL is not there probably looks better. But the A- the ApoB, the LDL particle count, and the LDL type look worse. So I don't know. Um, I need to do more research on berberin before I'm really comfortable talking about its mechanisms of action. But it has some mechanisms of action that mimic metformin. I don't know if that's what's impacting this. If it is, I'm actually not really a fan of metformin. So I'm probably not a huge fan of berberin. And I think that um, this makes me be unsure and not be very conclusive about whether berberin is good for cholesterol levels or not in this case. Anonymous attendee says, are there other low causes for cis aconitate, high citric acid, glutamate low, glutamine normal high, besides oxidative stress, all nutrients test okay per the cheat sheet? Very low. Um, okay, so these are, the aconitate and citric acid are um, markers in the citric acid cycle where we metabolize most of our energy. The, if this high citric, if citric acid is high and isocitric acid is low, this must be the Great Plains test, which doesn't have isocitrate. Cisaconitate seems to be the next better, best thing that's closely related. Um, that would indicate oxidative stress. Um, the glutamate is low. The glutamine is normal. Uh, I don't know. I don't think that's relevant to oxidative stress. So I don't see any basis to think of anything other than oxidative stress for the citric acid cycle markers. In terms of the glutamate being low, um, if your glutamate is low and your glutamine is on the high side, then you probably have ammonia generation from somewhere that you're mopping up with glutamate. That would be my guess. Um, But that's another can of worms to open. Okay, I'm going to flip back up to uh, some of the uh, higher up questions up here. Okay, Brian Lopez says, Chris, what do you think of Lauren Cordain? Do you think he has strict he has strict views on salt and dairy? Um, honestly, this is. Uh, um, Brian says, I'm also asking because he accuses Chris Kresser of not being a scientist and being a charismatic blogger about paleo. Um, you know, I can't answer that question because I, uh, I know I like. I don't follow many people because um, I'm busy making my content. Like I, um, I mean, to give you an example of what I'm doing, I spent uh, almost every day this week reading papers on niacin till um, midnight and waking up and doing the same. I did get a workout in. Uh, I think I did some, I, something else. Then this morning I woke up and I recorded two thirds of my niacin podcast with Alex Leaf. And then I immediately did this. I haven't eaten anything today yet because of that. Um, <laughs> I, feel, I feel pretty good for fasting. Um, then I'm going to finish this. Then I'm going to prepare for recording with Peter Atia tomorrow until Alex gets back and finish the niacin podcast. Then I'm going to finish preparing for Peter Atia tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to hope I have time for a workout. If not, I'm going to continue preparing for Peter Atia tomorrow. So I have no idea what Lauren Cordain is saying. I'm not saying you shouldn't follow Lauren Cordain. I'm just saying like, I don't, I don't have time to, like, I don't, I don't read what most of Chris Kresser puts out. Um, I listen to his podcast a lot because the podcast saves me time. I actually, I listen to most of his podcast. Um, if I were Chris Kresser, I wouldn't be 
watching all of Chris Master John's YouTube videos. If I have a question for Chris or Chris has a question for me, we email each other. And so, um, and so like, I don't, I just don't happen to email with Lauren Cordain. I, it's not anything against him. Um, I'm just not following other people like that, but let me, I mean, let me address the content. So Chris Kresser is, I mean, there's not really any content there. He's not a scientist. He's a charismatic blogger about paleo. Uh, no, Chris Kresser is not a scientist. When did Chris Kresser claim to be a scientist? Chris Kresser is a clinician. Chris Kresser is, uh, his background is in acupuncture. He has a better education in basic science than someone in acupuncture would have outside of California because of the regulations they have. Chris Kresser, like most good clinicians, his, his, the primary reason that he's good with nutrition and the other stuff that he writes about is that he has, he does his homework outside of that. You know, like what's the, di- like, what do medical doctors know anything about nutrition? This has nothing to do with Cordain. I'm just bringing, I'm riffing on it over in a different area. Do medical doctors know anything about nutrition? Well, what medical doctor are you talking about? Because there are some medical doctors that know all kinds of things about nutrition. And there are other medical doctors that know nothing. What's the difference? The difference is that in medical school, they don't learn anything about nutrition, but they do learn about biochemistry and molecular biology, which have at which have applications to nutrition and allow them to read about nutrition science when they get out of med school and understand it because they understand the biochemistry and molecular biology and they understand the anatomy and physiology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the medical doctor who spends all their time immersed in the research has good knowledge of nutrition. The medical doctor who uses what they learned in med school about nutrition has terrible knowledge of nutrition. So Chris Kressler doesn't have the background of a research scientist or a medical doctor, but his continuing education as a self-learner reading the research and his having other clinicians and other scientists on his podcast and always learning from them and his establishment, his paying people with expertise in different areas to do research for him and aggregate it, that system and that constant education is what make Chris Kresser knowledgeable. And um, his, he's not a scientist. So what? I mean, I'm, I'm not a scientist anymore either by some definitions. I'm a nutritional scientist. That's my background. I spent, um, over, I spent a decade doing laboratory science and, and doing research, designing research, carrying out experiments. My background is as a scientist, but by some definitions, I'm not a scientist anymore because what I'm doing is translating scientists into education. So some people might say I'm an educator. Like These labels are stupid. Um, anonymous attendee says Krebs psych. Okay. So, um, we have, uh, we have 12 minutes left on the clock, but I do have time to go over. So I will go over a little bit. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is please don't ask any more questions. I'm going to try to go through fairly succinctly and rapidly in the existing 25 questions here. Okay. Thomas says neither. I answered that question already. Anonymous attendee says, Krebs cycle marker question. Cisaconitate is low on urinary organic acids test while citrate is borderline high. This, this looks like the same question that I answered before. Um, a follow-up says, your fourth metabolism lesson said glutamate is being converted to alpha ketoglutarate to keep the citric acid cycle going. Yeah, that's what it normally does. Um, so we... Oh, so um, look, there's there's a whole there's a whole section in the cheat sheet on specifically on general oxidative stress testing. So you can go to that section. Um, in in the case you mentioned, so following up from the earlier case where glutamine was borderline high and glutamate was low, um, yeah, the glutamate could be, cons- be could be being consumed in the Krebs cycle. But if that were what's going on, I would expect that to be tugging on the glutamine so that the glutamine would be dropping too. If the glutamate is dropping and the glutamine is rising in proportion, then I think the glutamate is being converted to glutamine, which means that it's soaking up ammonia. Laura Lee says, my friend, 20-year-old male, has had severe and painful cystic acne for the past several years. His social life, school, and self-esteem are hugely impacted. He is stressed and depressed. After two rounds of botanical antimicrobial protocols by a Crestor Institute certified FH, this is 
Effie, I'm guessing that's um, familial hypercholesterolemia or maybe not. Um, and six months paleo diet, two months dairy-free, eggs-free is seeing little improvement in acne. Acne consistently gets worse with stress, significant improvement only seen when he does cardio regularly, but never lasting and never enough. He's not in the U.S. and doesn't have access to comprehensive gut testing or Cyrex labs. He will come to us U.S. in about a year or so. He's fed up and seriously considering Accutane. Um, well, out of everything that you said, his issue is stress. Why does the cardio help? Um, if, car if it gets worse with stress and cardio helps, then I think the problem is stress and stress management is the key to that. Doing cardio regularly is probably a fundamental component of stress management. It is for me, it is for some people that I am close to. So I know that can, that can be a role. Probably adding meditation to that would play a role. And I wouldn't be doing gut testing in Cyrex labs. I'd be doing testing on stress hormones and related hormones. Uh, and to like topical, I don't know anything about topical treatments for acne, but it's a microbiome thing. But it clearly in that person's case, it's the stress response that's, um, that's, going, that's going on there. Anonymous attendee says, choline question mark. That's a question. I have MTHFD1, PEMT, MTRR SNPs that impact choline, but MTHFR is normal. I eat two eggs a day. How much choline supplementation should I take? Um, you should not take any choline supplementation based on what you told me. Uh, yeah, you, you probably should just eat the eggs, as particularly if you, the rest of your diet is nutrient-dense. Anonymous attendee says, I have an arachidonic acid level of 189 in the low zone on ion with an AA-EPA ratio. I don't... I don't care about the AEP to ratio. Uh, I do care about the arachidonic acid level. Should I supplement with 250 milligrams? What brand is there from a well-known company? You want 250 milligrams of arachidonic acid, eat an egg. <laughs> um, like, I, like, I don't know anything about arachidonic acid supplements yet, except that they exist because... You can eat eggs, and you're, you'll get you'll get plenty. Do you want to try the supplement? Yeah, you can. You can. You eat two eggs a day already, so eat four. Um, the uh, oxidative stress and inflammation will drive will will consume the arachidonic acid. So look at that. But um, but if you're just talking about a supplement, sure, add a supplement or eat more eggs. Anonymous attendee, I have PTH intact, thirty six, calcium nine point four, calcitriol. 63.3, vitamin D, uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D, 60. My diet includes green vegetables, salmon, bone, and collagen. Should I add 800 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium? You should try to get 1,200, 812 milligrams of calcium total, and you should supplement if you need to do that. But if you have green vegetables, salmon, bones, and collagen, well, the collagen doesn't matter. If you have green, egg, green vegetables and salmon bones, you know, look at whether your diet is meeting that and bring the total up with a, with a supplement if necessary. Jen Dunlap says... <laughs> do you think there are true non-responders to creatine or do you think that those apparent non-responders likely have some defect of methylation that means the typical doses of creatine are only sufficient for other needs? You know, Alex Leaf would be a great person to ask about this uh, and he is not here right now. Oh, Al Alex, Alex, um, I, ca I can't give you the mic because it's, it's connected to my lapel. So Jen wants, actually I can, uh, Je so Jen's question is, are there true non-responders to creatine or do you just think that those apparent non-responders likely have some defect in methylation that means the typical doses of creatine are only sufficient for their needs? Yeah, I don't think that methylation is going to be relevant here. So when you look at responders and non-responders, the difference seems to be in their ability to uptake creatine into muscle cells from the serum. And so I don't have like a good explanation. I don't have a Chris Master John explanation for that, but I can say that it's very unlikely to be related to methylation and it has to probably do with differences in their like creatine transporter abilities across cell membranes and stuff. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, okay. better better than uh, anything I can do right now. So let me fix this one.
Uh, Anana says, would you expect neurotransmitters and precursors, phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, et cetera, to all be low in the ion test if the test was done 24 hour, after 24 hours of fasting? No, the test is designed to be, oh, after 24 hours of fasting? Um, I don't know. You should follow the instructions for fasting when you do the ion test because the ranges are built on the assumption that you're following the instructions. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it seems conceivable. It certainly seems plausible that that 24 hours of fasting could lower a lot of things. Anonymous says, when should tryptophan be taken on a keto diet, night, day, both? Uh, it doesn't matter. So what I would do is when presumably you're doing this to try to increase tryptophan getting into the brain. So the most important thing is to take it two or three hours away from other protein. And the second consideration is if you have an allotment of carbs that is concentrated at one time of the day, and it is not important for you to consume those carbs along with the other protein, then take the tryptophan away from the protein and with the carbs. But if you don't want to take carbs separate from protein in that manner, then just time it so it's away from the protein. Anonymous says creatine, when is it recommended if you don't have the MTHFR SNP that causes methylation problems? When you want to improve your physique, when you want to improve your athletic performance, when you want to, when you certainly when you have a rare creatine uh, synthesis <laughs> disorder, if you have depression, it might help. And if you have any signs that something else is messing with your methylation, even though the, that your genetics don't explain it, that would be a, a fair time to consider it. Thoughts on PQQ and CoQ10 supplementation? I haven't studied PQQ. CoQ10, uh, if you don't want to eat heart meat, which is where all the CoQ10 is, I don't think it's a bad idea. But... Um, I don't know, test it out and see if it improves your energy or your cognitive performance. If it does, keep it in. If not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it. Any thoughts on ashwagandha supplementation? I have not studied ashwagandha. I know that many people hold it in high regard, but I can't say anything about it right now. When high selenium does not come down in response to dietary efforts and cessation of supplementation, what's going on? Um, either there's high levels of selenium in the soil where your food is grown, or you have low methylation because methylation is needed to get rid of excess selenium. We consume a lot of farm fresh eggs, four daily per person, kids as well as adults. Since eggs are packed with a lot of nutrients, should there be a concern of there if there's no limit on how many eggs a person should consume? And um, Brian adds that Brian adds that polygamine has some things to add and recommends three eggs at most. Four eggs would probably be too much. I think four eggs is fine. You know, actually, I eat four eggs a day, so I don't think it's a problem. Um, but, you know, I would change my tune if I had hypercholesterolemia. Are low polyunsaturated omega-6 values on the ion test a concern? Uh, not the total, but the, if the arachidonic acid levels are low, I would look at low arachidonic acid intake or inflammation or oxidative stress consuming the arachidonic acid. And it would concern me because arachidonic acid is important to a lot of physiological functions, but I don't care about the total omega-6. I had RT3 high and found selenium to increase temperature. Anonymous might be responding to um, Thomas at the beginning, maybe. Um, Otherwise, that's great to hear that the selenium helped with the RT3 in the body pump again. Anonymous says a value of arsenic, a high value of arsenic, a concern. Um, yeah, I mean, arsenic is a toxin. You probably don't want a lot of it. If it's just a little high, it might not cause terrible damage. But um, I would I would look at methylation if I saw high arsenic because methylations need to get rid of arsenic. My, oh, actually, I should add that um, methylation supplements have been shown to help arsenic, uh, 
arsenic toxification in areas of the world where arsenic was a serious concern. Stephen Hillbrand says, my cardioion profile test showed results that I'm high in d arabinitol indicating fungal infection. How can I address that problem? My other results were pretty much normal. Uh, I don't know because I don't know where the fungal infection is coming from and I don't know what kind of fungus it is. And um, so I don't know. Uh, I think that in, if you have any evidence of fungal infection in the skin, then I think riboflavin and light therapy would be helpful. I think light therapy on its own would be helpful, but it would probably be more helpful with supplemental riboflavin. Um, I think short of that, you want to you want to be doing a stool test and. I don't know. Talk to a gut person to see if there's any testing that can be done for small intestinal fungal overgrowth. I don't know where the state of that is right now. Miles Nichols says, hi, Chris, I have a question about electrolyte balance. I have several patients who have increased migraines, eye twitching, and or increased body odor and sweating after coffee. Interesting. I assume this is normal body odor. Clinically, magnesium and potassium have helped in some cases. In other cases, there were still issues that got resolved with increased salt intake. Makes uh, tremendous sense. My questions are, can coffee cause sodium and other electrolyte deficiencies? Is the mechanism mild diuretic or others? I don't know off the top of my head, but I know there's some controversy over the diuretic effects of caffeine, but I know that it, it's certainly plausible that it has a diuretic effect and that a diuretic effect certainly has the potential to waste electrolytes. I would also note that there is uh, there are compound, non, non-caffeine compounds in coffee that can interfere with B6 function. And so that could potentially play into some of the twitching and migraines. Is it, uh, okay, what would migraines increasing from coffee but decreasing when sodium is added mean? Electrolytes. Sodium is needed to uh, make GABA function, which might oppose headache, uh, might oppose migraines. Sodium is needed to clear glutamate, which might contribute to migraines. What would um, what would migraines? Uh, water being drawn to saltier brain tissues and increasing intracranial pressure. Um, hmm. similar mechanism for increasing sweating and body odor, salt being drawn out of the blood towards the skin. I'd have to, I don't know. I'd have to put some thought into this to really come up with a, with a like mechanistic hypothesis that, that can reconciles all of these pieces of data. Um, but like I said, salt is super important to neurotransmitters. Uh, like you said, so caffeine is, let's see, caffeine's an Adenosine antagonist. Adenosine, if I remember right, causes vasodilation. So caffeine should cause vasoconstriction. I'm not this. Yeah, I, these are things that I, if I were putting a hypothesis together, I'd be triple checking everything that I'm saying right now. Um, it, it could it could be related to a vasodilatory effect. Um, it could be related to an adrenal response. So I do know, for example, that when I have um, like four or five or more drinks, I will get insomnia that will only go away if I take like a handful of salt and a full one or two glasses of water and um, as well as like an electrolyte cocktail. I don't get twitching or, or other stuff, but I think there's a relation here. And I think that's the diuretic effect of the alcohol is causing electrolyte loss, which is causing a blood volume response, which is causing an adrenal response. And the adrenal response is what's keeping me up. Then it could probably be a factor in headaches, I would think. But I'm just guessing. Also, normally I expect edema to come with extra salt consumption. No, not necessarily, particularly if your blood volume is low. But some people in my practice notice decreasing bloating and overall water weight fluctuations decrease. 
that's possible. This goes against some of my biochemical understanding of sodium increased pushing more. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. There's a paradoxical reduction in, um, in water volume that can come with sodium in highly unusual circumstances. And preeclampsia in pregnancy is one of those. And I, I don't off the top of my head know the physiology of it. And this is like, this is something I really need to sit down and think about for a while before I have a very good explanation for it. Weston Holzinger says, what are your thoughts if signs and symptoms of zinc deficiency persist unless consistently taking upwards of 75 milligrams a day? Gluconate form, already watch your phytic acid intake, make sure it doesn't conflict, have, have not done plasma zinc. Well, you should do plasma zinc. Um, also, I, you know, I, I, I kind of, I wonder whether you're taking that right. So um, if you're taking 75 milligrams of zinc, zinc like at one time, then it's not surprising because you're absorbing like seven of those milligrams and, and the rest you're not. Uh, if you actually are doing this in a way that's going to maximize the absorption, which would be to take them as far apart as possible, as close to an empty stomach as possible, in doses of 10 milligrams or less, or if you can't get doses that small, 15 milligrams, you're doing that. And and um, the dif and the signs of deficiency persist. They pers I mean, they're persisting when you're taking that, then they're probably not zinc. If they're persisting until you take that and it goes away, then either you aren't absorbing the zinc well or you're not taking it right. Those are the two things. And if you're not absorbing it well, it could be um, general malabsorption disorder, uh, something causing loss of bile or, uh, or a, a polymorphism or genetic impairment in a zinc transporter or low methylation, which can affect zinc transporters. Anonymous says, I do intermittent fasting in a keto diet with ketones greater than one. I assume that's greater than one millimoles beta hydroxybutyrate daily. I found that if I start fasting before 3 p.m., then my sleep suffers with my suffers with middle of the night wake ups. I'd prefer to stop eating earlier. Do you think the issue is electrolytes or hunger? If I start fasting before three, then my you're doing intermittent fasting for the whole evening starting before three. And you'd prefer to stop eating earlier. You are, your protocol is causing sleeping problems. And I like, I don't see the point of trying to try to figure out how to mitigate them. Um, I would never do that because I wouldn't sleep. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I respect that you. Um, I respect that you want to do that. I'm not saying you're making the wrong choice, um, but it just strikes me as so predictable that I would have sleeping problems doing that. That I wouldn't even dream of trying to figure out how to not have those sleeping problems um, because I can't conceive of how I could do that without having sleeping problems. Could you summarize your current thoughts on supplementation to optimize sleep? Um, Way too big a question for the um, for the fast answer round at the end of the uh, at the end of this. I I have sleep recommendations at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash sleep, and I don't think supplements are. I have ten recommendations that I spent a decade figuring out how to fix my sleep that I put together, and. Off the top of my head, I don't even think there are supplements in there. And uh, I'm not saying that there, supplements aren't warranted, but I don't think there are, supplements are not in the top 10 in my approach to sleep. All right, we're light is at the end of the tunnel. Um, oh, one question left. Philippa says, for someone with no diagnosed thyroid disease, but with a TSH in the higher end of the reference range, what are the best dietary supplement strategies to optimize thyroid function? And to what extent is it advisable to limit goitrogenic foods? Okay, so no diagnosed thyroid disease. TSH is above the range. 
Um, you really need, there has to be more information. I don't think there's a blanket response to that. If someone's TSH is elevated, then their thyroid gland is most likely not making as much thyroid hormone as their pituitary gland thinks it should be. And so it's probably a primary problem in the thyroid gland. It's probably not any kind of serious medical disorder given that the TSH is, oh, in the higher end of the reference range. Okay. So maybe this is the higher end of the normal range for conventional ranges and above the range of what some people say is functional. And so it's in that gray area where some people say it's too high. If that's the only thing that's high, then, um, you know, probably the thyroid gland is just not, is making a little bit less thyroid hormone than the pituitary thinks it should. And so that means maybe the person needs more protein. Maybe the person needs more iodine. Maybe the person needs more selenium. Maybe the person needs more antioxidant support. Um, more in- yeah. I mean, those are the, those are the major things. Um, protein, iodine, probably not even carbohydrate in this case. Um, yeah, protein, iodine, selenium, antioxidant support would be the top things that I would look at. Goitrogenic foods, yes. So what goitrogenic foods do is they compete for iodine uptake into the thyroid gland. And if there's a high, but it's all about the ratio. For, for most goitrogenic foods, it's all about the ratio. So if you have a high iodine intake uh, and a low goitrogenic intake, you get a lot of iodine in the thyroid gland. If you have a low iodine intake and a high goitrogenic intake, then you have low iodine intake into the thyroid gland. And it's the more goitrogens you eat, the more iodine you need. And, and so there is a rule for that. But the primary thing is getting the iodine in there, getting the protein in there, and getting the selenium and other antioxidant support. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for your participation. I am, uh, you know, one, let's see. Ah. Hopefully these questions do not disappear when I end this meeting because uh, I, they would be very helpful for making the show notes. Um, there's a couple of things in the chat. Let me just uh, make sure that um, okay, no, I didn't miss in the chat. Okay. Um, Pam says, thank you for everything you do and for all of us, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Pam, for showing up. Thank you to all of you for showing up. I really appreciate you showing up. Um, This was a blast and I'll see you in the next one. I'll try to post notice earlier about the schedule of the next one, um, which I want to do soon. So so hopefully I'll, I'll post that notice very, very soon. All right, take care, guys. This episode is brought to you by Ancestral Supplements. Traditional peoples, Native Americans, and early ancestral healers believed that eating the organs from a healthy animal would strengthen and support the health of the corresponding organ of the individual. For example, the traditional way of treating a person with a weak heart was to feed the person the heart of a healthy animal. Modern science makes sense of this. Heart is uniquely rich in coenzyme Q10, which supports heart health. The importance of eating organs, though, is much broader than simply matching the organ you eat to the organ you want to nourish. For example, natives of the Arctic had very limited access to plant foods and got their vitamin C from adrenal glands. Vitamin C is important to far more parts of your body than simply your adrenals. In his epic work, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, Weston Price recorded a story of natives who cured blindness using eyeballs, which are very rich in vitamin A. But now that we understand vitamin A, we know that we can get even more vitamin A by eating liver, making liver good for your eyes. Our ancestors made liberal use of organ meats both to be economical and to utilize their healing and nourishing properties. Animals in the wild do the same. Weston Price had also recorded a story of how the zoos in his era were capturing lions, tigers, and leopards, oh my, only to watch them become infertile in captivity. Researchers then observed what the lions did when they killed zebras in the wild. What they did was they went straight for the organs and bone marrow, leaving the muscle meat behind for the birds. But even the birds took what they could of the organs and bone marrow. 
Price reported that once the zookeepers started feeding the animals organ meats, boom, their fertility returned. The problem I often encounter, though, is that many people just don't like eating organ meats. Let's face it, if you weren't raised on them, it can be very hard to acquire a taste for them. That is where Ancestral comes in. Ancestral Supplements has a nose-to-tail product line of grass-fed liver, organ meats, living collagen, bone marrow, and more, all in the convenience of a gelatin capsule. For more information or to buy any of their products, go to ancestralsupplements.com. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This episode is brought to you by Ample. Ample is incredible. It's a meal in a bottle that takes a total of two minutes to prepare, consume, and clean up. Two minutes. I'm not kidding. Now, I know what you're thinking. Anything that quick just has to be made of synthetic ingredients that you'd have a hard time pronouncing and wouldn't want to put into your body. But it's not. Ample is made entirely from natural ingredients and designed to provide an optimal balance between protein, fat, and carbs, as well as all the vitamins and minerals that you'd need in a single meal. There's no question that it's always best to sit down and take your time eating a home-cooked meal from fresh ingredients. But let's face it, oftentimes we just don't have time for that. If you live a busy life like I do and your goal is to get things done, you need quality fuel that you can get into your system quickly. Here's a great example where Ample is perfect for me. When I shoot videos, it takes hours to set up and break down all of my equipment. So I try to get as many videos shot in a day as possible. This prevents wasting a lot of time on setup and helps me conserve big blocks of time outside of shooting videos to get into a flow state where I can research something to my heart's content and spend all the time I need thinking about it creatively and analytically. But if I spend hours dealing with recording equipment plus hours spent preparing food, eating it, and cleaning up, there's like no time left over to actually shoot any videos. So on recording days, I use Ample to maximize efficiency and focus on getting things done. Ample comes in three versions, original, keto, and vegan. And each version comes in two portion sizes, 400 calorie and 600 calorie. The 600 calorie original version gives me 37 grams of protein from a mix of grass-fed whey and collagen, which promotes satiety and flips my brain on. Its fat comes from coconut oil and macadamia nut oil. I like these oils because they're low in polyunsaturated fatty acids, or PUFAs, oils that promote aging and are usually loaded into the processed foods that most people eat when they need something on the go. The coconut oil provides some medium-chain fats to keep my energy levels up, too. The carbs, the vitamins, and the minerals all come exclusively from food sources like sweet potatoes, bananas, cocoa powder, wheat, and barley grass, and chlorella. It's full of natural prebiotic fibers and probiotics to promote a healthy microbiome, and the gentle sweetness comes from a mix of honey, monk fruit, and stevia. I just mix it with water, drink it, rinse out the bottle, and boom, two minutes in and I'm fully fueled and ready to face the next phase of the day. I first came across Ample when I met its founder and CEO, Connor Young, at PaleoFX a few years ago. Connor inspired me with his vision for Ample, which I anticipate will be much more than a meal in a bottle in the near future. I've become an official advisor to Ample, and I'll be helping Ample design scientific research that will lead both to an ever-improving Ample and, I hope, meaningful contributions to our understanding of how to use nutrition to help people be healthier and happier and perform better at the challenges that they care most about. As a listener to the Mastering Nutrition podcast, I've also worked out a special deal for you. If you use the discount code CHRIS15, you'll get 15% off your first order of Ample. To get your discount, go to amplemeal.com. That's amplemeal.com, A-M-P-L-E-M-E-A-L.com, amplemeal.com, and use the code CHRIS15 at checkout. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to ask a question in the next AMA, you can sign up for the CMJ Masterpass. The CMJ Masterpass is an all-access pass to early content, ad-free, and with transcripts, even of these AMAs. And you get monthly, at least monthly, often more than that, monthly access to participate in one of these AMAs where you can ask your question. You can ask it by text or you can share your mic. You can even share your webcam to ask your question if you'd like. You can sign up for the CMJ Masterpass at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass slash mastering nutrition. Using that link or using using that URL or using the link in the description of this episode will earn you a lifetime 10% discount. 
One of the things we mentioned in this AMA is my guide to testing nutritional status. It's called Testing Nutritional Status, The Ultimate Cheat Sheet. If you have a copy, thank you so much. Um, if you don't have a copy and you would like a copy, you can get one at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash cheat sheet. Use the code Mastering Nutrition for $5 off. If you want more of me, you can find me at chrismasterjohnphd.com and I'm at chrismasterjohn on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, a little bit of Snapchat and YouTube. Hope it's been fun and I will see you in the next episode.